Hi, welcome to Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Rege, consultant psychiatrist. Today I'll be taking you through a summary of the Ranzab guidelines of schizophrenia uh, that were published um, on the Cytoscene Hub um, some time ago. What we're going to be focusing on uh, with the treatment of schizophrenia is often we think about the acute treatment, the short-term treatment, which is the treatment of acute, uh, acute psychosis, but we often tend to forget uh, the longer-term treatment, uh, the recovery aspects. Um, and recovery is a very, very important part of psychiatric management. So what is recovery and what are the features of the recovery model? So firstly, it's a journey of small steps. Secondly, um, there has to be a growing sense of agency and autonomy where patient wishes uh, are at the core of treatment. Um, this also includes involving families closely. The next bit is providing a safe and secure housing. Employment is a key factor, the vocational aspects of rehabilitation and social relationships being very important as well. So when we're looking at the treatment of schizophrenia, we'll be looking at helping patients achieve these key goals as we move towards recovery. Now, when we think about schizophrenia as a whole, we know that many patients present with prodromal symptoms, symptoms in the early stages of the illness. As a result of this, there has been a staging approach that has been proposed by Professor Pat McGorry. Um, and this is a summary of the staging approach of schizophrenia, all the way from stage zero to stage four. And as we can see, uh, stage zero is an individual with increased risk, but no symptoms, while stage four is someone with severe persistent symptoms impact on cognition and functioning. There are also individuals that are at ultra high risk and fulfill an ultra high risk criteria for schizophrenia where we've got to think closely or continue monitoring them closely. And these include individuals with a family history of psychosis or a schizotypal personality disorder with psychosocial decline, attenuated psychotic symptoms, not meeting threshold for a diagnosis of psychotic disorder, and a third one is what's called blips, which is brief, limited, intermittent psychotic symptoms. Now, one of the key factors that influences recovery is side effects. So let's cover side effects briefly. Um, so one of the side effects that we need to think about is extrapyramidal side effects. And one of those is, that is quite disabling is uh, type of dyskinesia. Now, as we can see here from the slide uh, that Older medications such as haloperidol have a much higher incidence of type of dyskinesia uh, as compared to the newer medications, for example, aripiprazole. And you can see olanzapine uh, has a lower incidence of type of dyskinesia, uh, clozapine uh, as well, including risperidone. The next important side effect that can often be missed is hyperprolactinemia, increased prolactin levels. And this happens because of the dopamine D2 blockade. Um, by antipsychotic medications. So what are the ways in which we could consider addressing this? The first one is to ensure that we carry out a good endocrine workup, um, LH, FSH, testosterone, and in some cases an MRI of the pituitary area as well. The next step is to consider a low risk antipsychotic or to consider a switch. And the third bit is adjunctive approaches that show some evidence, for example, augmentation with aripiprazole. We do have newer medications such as brectopiprazole as well, uh, which is a partial dopamine agonist. Um, augmentation with metformin, um, sex steroid replacements, and bromocryptine or cabergoline, which are dopamine agonists. The next important aspect is to look at metabolic function. Now, when we look at the range of guidelines, there are a number of parameters that we need to take into account. But essentially, these are the, these are the main parameters that we summarize in this slide. We need to look at fasting glucose, uh, monitor the baseline 12 to 24 weeks and then annually. Fasting lipids, prolactin, some guidelines do mention it, some don't. BMI and waist circumference. Now, uh, some guidelines do not mention waist circumference, but, uh, sorry, do not mention BMI, but waist circumference is an important proxy uh, for metabolic um, dysfunction. Blood pressure is the other one that we need to monitor very closely. Now, what are the pharmacological strategies to ameliorate weight gain associated with antipsychotics? Broadly, we have the possibility of selecting right at the start low risk approaches. Uh, so medications such as lorazidone, aripiprazole, and brexpiprazole. 
And the other aspects include adjunctive therapy. So looking at topiramate, metformin, and newer approaches such as liraglutide, statins, melatonin. I've put aripiprazole there. We know aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, um, are augment aripiprazole particularly is an augmentation strategy with lanzapine or clozapine uh, to address weight gain. We also have what's called the guideline when individuals don't respond to antipsychotics and TRIP, which is the Treatment Response and Resistance and Psychosis Guideline for Establishing Adequate Treatment Response. So this included, um, when we think about adequate treatment response, the first point is symptoms rated at no more than mild. Second, duration that this result is sustained for at least 12 weeks. And the third bit is including functioning when we think about response, which is impairment is mild or better on a standardized scale. Now, one of the important aspects to take into account is compliance. And what are the factors that affect compliance? This can be divided into three groups. Firstly, think about the patient factors. Second, treatment factors. And third, illness factors. For example, patient factors could include cultural and family issues, experiences of the illness, support network, personality factors, psychological reactants. Uh, the treatment factors include side effects from medication, complexity of taking medication, stigma associated with taking medication, non-effectiveness of medication, uh, and illness factors include, for example, delusions around medication or treatment provider, depressions, so they have negative thoughts that they won't get better, or nihilistic belief systems, a lack of motivation, cognitive impairments, or forgetting to take medication. So one should look at these factors and try to address this in overall treatment. The next important aspect to take into account with treatment of schizophrenia is looking at psychosocial factors, psychosocial um, treatments. So for example, cognitive behavioral therapy for resistant hallucinations and delusions, music therapy, art therapy, cognitive remediation if they've got cognitive um, uh, deficits, uh, social skills training, narrative therapy, uh, metacognitive training. So these are all a range of uh, treatments that have been included in guidelines um, so the clinicians do not forget the psychosocial aspects when it comes to schizophrenia. Now let's look at the acute aspect and you can see I've, I've clearly included the recovery aspects initially and then come to the acute um, treatment. So if we do have um, acute arousal symptoms or acute psychosis then there are three key steps to take into account. Firstly, for mild to moderate arousal we can consider oral lorazepam, one to two milligrams, or olanzapine, five to 10 milligrams that is repeated after 30 to 60 minutes. Step two includes, um, this is for moderate to high arousal, oral olanzapine, 10 to 20 milligrams plus lorazepam, one to two milligrams repeated if necessary after 30 to 60 minutes. And step three, uh, if the patient's highly aroused, you know, there's elements of aggression present, etc., or acute psychosis. Then intramuscular lanzapine may be required, 10 milligrams, or droperidol, 2.5 to 10 milligrams. And this is preferred in cases where um, there is stimulant-associated psychosis, for example, methamphetamine-associated psychosis. Now, I'll summarize the pharmacological treatment for first episode in non-effective psychosis from the Ramsap guidelines. And the steps include the following. Firstly, a psychiatric and physical assessment and allow an antipsychotic drug-free assessment phase. And one may consider adding a benzodiazepine, uh, if, you know, symptomatic treatment, for example, sleep disturbances, add temazepam, anxiety, consider lorazepam. If there's a psychiatric emergency, of course, you go to the acute arousal protocol that I just touched on earlier. Um, and after a while, you may consider starting antipsychotic treatment. Start low, go slow. Now, in some cases, long-acting injectables may be appropriate and can be administered, and this is a first-line treatment within a shared decision-making framework, so discuss the risks and benefits with the patient. Consider differential diagnosis, um, as in some cases, if there are affective symptoms present, differentials such as bipolar affective disorder with psychotic features, schizoaffective disorders, um, mainly because mood stabilizers may be required, required as adjuncts to antipsychotic treatment. And you may start with any of the antipsychotic treatment. It's important that when you consider antipsychotic treatment, think about side effects. So you may consider starting with medication with a lower metabolic burden, lorazepam, aripiprazole, brexpiprazole. 
But here are some of the doses if you do consider. Um, the Brexpropazole isn't in this because at the time the guidelines uh, were written, it wasn't on the market. And, you know, once you start with low dose, you then increase according to efficacy and tolerability. Um, think about non-adherence uh, and all those factors that can influence non-adherence. Uh, look at response, you know, and in first episode, there is a bit of debate in terms of how long to continue it. And you can see here it says if there's a response, continue treatment for at least two to five years. Um, in some cases, you know, discussion after a year should be, should be looked at. And if discontinuing, stop gradually over at least three to six months with uh, close follow-up. If insufficient response after three weeks, then increase the dose over the next two to three weeks and optimize psychosocial interventions. Um, and you can see here if non response up to six to eight weeks, you consider a switch to another second generation antipsychotics. And if non-response to a second antipsychotic trial, consider a lanzapine. Um, and if not, then one would consider, you know, that will fulfill criteria for treatment resistant psychosis. And we know clozapine has best evidence uh, in treatment resistant schizophrenia. Uh, and here you would follow the clozapine protocol, something that we'll cover in another hub bite. So these are the range of antipsychotic medications in Australia and as you can see Brexpazole was not included in guidelines as it wasn't available at times the guidelines were produced. But really the key factor here to consider is think about the metabolic burden, think about side effects, type of dyskinesia, prolactin elevation, metabolic burden when you consider uh, choosing the first line antipsychotic as that will influence recovery from the long term. If you do want to read the full article, visit psychscenehub.com in the search box, enter Ranzap Guidelines Schizophrenia and you'll reach the article. There are of course a range of other articles as well. Um, so enjoy, stay safe.